Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. On this edition of the program, we discuss whether there is such a thing as the Obama Doctrine. If there is, is it a good thing? And again, Syria, the word partition won't go away. Also, is Russia really trying to topple Angela Merkel and determine the destiny of the UK? And finally, why are we watching the South China Sea? Two crosstalk stories in the media. I'm joined by my guest, Dmitry Babich. He is a political analyst with Sputnik International. We also have Mark Sloboda. He's an international affairs and security analyst. And we have Rory Suchet. He is a RT News presenter. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in any time you want, and I very much encourage it. Mark, Jeffrey Goldberg wrote an article, a very, very long article, called The Obama Doctrine. First of all, is there such a thing as the Obama Doctrine in your mind? Okay, well... This is a piece that appeared in the pages of The Atlantic in the last week, and it is basically an attempt, a friendly attempt, uh, by, uh, we could call it softball, we could call it a puff piece, we could call it other things, by uh, Obama and by his administration to lay out their narrative uh, on the foreign policy legacy of Obama before he even leaves okay. office. Which is quite Which remarkable in itself. So uh, the, the, the article's premise title is the Obama Doctrine, and it attempts to take uh, Obama's feckless, waffling foreign policy and ascribe to it the characteristic uh, of a doctrine, uh, which the article makes clear it is absolutely anything but. Not only does he waffle from, from issue to issue, right, without any uh, a, a apparent coherency or uh, grand strategy, which isn't necessarily needed, but more than that, um, he waffles within an issue. Yeah. Uh, from, from one side to the other without seeing anything well, through completely. And th the most important thing he does in this article is attempt to um, uh, pin the blame uh, on everything that has gone right. wrong. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go to that one for a second. Blame game is rampant in that article. Exactly. It's absolutely rampant. And that being said, though, the interviewer, Mr. Goldberg, was it, who did this? I mean, if you actually read this article, it's almost like a pillow talk between two strange bedfellows. It's such a soft interview. And yet Obama is blaming, for example, Libya. Who, what does he say about Libya? Oh, it's Cameron's fault. I had more faith in my, in, in my European partners, and he blames it on them. Well, not only, Rory, but not only does he blame it on foreign leaders, he blames it on his own staff, the people yeah. that appoint, he appointed to run his foreign policy the, for the last Last eight years. Harry the takes a lot of grief in that article. The too. Afghanistan surge? That's the Pentagon's fault. The uh, covert war to overthrow the Syrian government? That's the CIA's fault, as well as Saudi and Erdogan. Libya? That's Sarkozy and Cameron's fault. Everything else? Well, that's Powers, Clinton, and Kerry. And of course, it's always Putin is blamed for everything, everything. else. Peer, peer pressure <laughs> made Obama do it. We have the President I, I, I of the United States blaming peer pressure. I do feel like this person, Jeffrey Goldberg, has amnesia because here's what he writes. Obama, unlike liberal interventionists, is an admirer of foreign policy realism of George Herbert Walker Bush, the senior. Well, let me remind you that George Herbert Walker Bush, the senior, when he went to Kiev and he saw exactly the same people who did the Maidan in their milder variant, it was 1991, they were much better, less violent. George Bush asked them not to topple the government, not to do stupid things. Obama supported a much more aggressive, uh, well, basically a, a violent coup in, yeah. in, in Ukraine. And we know well, that. that. Is, and the author and knows that. And that is completely whitewashed in that article. Mark, my, uh, one of the things I took away from it is that um, in Obama's mind, in the people around him, there is such a thing as imperialism light which there isn't. Go ahead. Oh, oh absolutely. And w when you mention that Obama tries to cast himself as a re not as a liberal interventionist, mm -hmm. but as a realist, he, he, he is, uh, in fact, they even describe him as an optimistic uh, Hobbesian. Uh, as if this obvious contradiction yeah. in terms yeah, somehow right. makes his feckless flip-flopping nature uh, a virtue uh, rather than, than, than a vice. But Mark, is it, is it fair though to put all the grief on Obama? Because you hear people say, look, come on, don't yeah. give him too much because he's just the guy at the drive through window. He, he is huh? the commander-in-chief, yeah. yeah. the president of the United States. Mm. Uh, him blaming peer pressure on someone else, right? Mm. Uh, the, everyone else made me do it. That is simply not well, acceptable well, well, from well, the, well, most, well, the, the leader I, of the most powerful uh, country. Another thing that I took away from it is, um, you know, if we can use metaphors here, is that, you know, he's, pat, um, Obama pats, pats himself him on the back yeah. for, uh, 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 like a, 
an arsonist who restrains himself yes. from time to time. Mm. Again, this imperialism light. There's no such thing. It's imperialism, and it's been the same thing that we've seen since the end of the Cold War all the way to the present. No one has missed a heartbeat here. Sure. Yeah, but, but sure. I, I'm still grateful to the author of this article, Jeffrey Goldberg, for showing us uh, what kind of terrible people were indeed in Europe. You know, the fact that Manuel Valls bemoaned, you know, the uh, current French prime minister, bemoaned the fact that uh, Obama didn't bomb the Syrian government troops yeah. in 2013, that was a revelation to me. You know, uh, Manuel Valls is uh, uh, quoted as saying, by not intervening early, we have created a monster. Well, I mean, hmm. uh, if uh, Obama had bombed the Syrian government's position in 2013, the so-called Islamic State would not be in Raqqa. You know, it would be in Damascus now, right. complete with chemical weapons and other well, dreadful bombs. Bring dreadful peace, don't they? Bombs well, always bring peace. It, one don't. of the interesting yeah. things that the article also tells us is that um, how feckless the Europeans really are and how much they expect the Americans there to, 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 the right, yeah, to carry the water all the time. <laughs> Again, one of the, you know, probably the biggest takeaway I got from this article is that nobody's responsible for anything. Huh? Yeah, I, it, it, it goes a, a little bit beyond that, I think. It, it, it attempts to um, lay down the militarism, uh, the imperialism that Obama has propagated around the world, his uh, massive campaign of drone assassinations. Right. Which has surpassed his uh, predecessor. Uh, it goes way beyond his predecessor. His predecessor had a policy of torture. Of, of renditions, kidnapping, and torture. Obama cleaned Obama, that up. Obama, Obama has killed more war. Arabs than and ISIS, ISIS has. Yes. He, Remember he, that. He, he, oh, but killing is much cleaner than torture. It doesn't leave a trail. Right. If he assassinates thousands of people, never mind that many of them turn out to be innocent civilians with policies of signature strikes, so you're in the wrong place at the wrong <laughs> time in your own country that the U.S. isn't at war with. Um, uh, but... We're talking a U.S. president who is lauded with a Nobel Peace Prize, has an assassination czar, officially dubbed, um, has a kill list that is constantly added to and by a disposition he, he, and matrix. And he came to office promising to close Gitmo, uh, which, which at the much, end of his administration... has really been accomplished in his presidency? But, uh, you know, what I uh, really impressed me in these articles, you know, the article in the National Interest, which is, in right. fact, a reaction to the article in the Atlantic Monthly, the author, Alexander Bennett, he says that Obama's doctrine is about exaggerating sets of limitations on U.S. power. End of quote. So John Brennan, when yeah. he brings to Obama <laughs> the lists of people who need to be killed, he's limiting, yeah. uh, putting limitations on American power. And so the problem is that it, these people... So let's, remi let's remind our viewers here, you're, the, the, this criticism from the national interest is saying that, uh, that um, uh, Obama failed in American leadership in the yes, world. Yes. And I, I, my, you know, my entire mantra is that the world needs a lot less American but, leadership. But, but, All right, just, right, real if, quick, because we want to talk about Syria. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bennett in the national interest simply doesn't have his facts right. He writes that Obama, uh, Adma, Obama's administration relocated missile defense systems from Czech Republic and from Poland, the ones which were directed against Russia. The fact is there were no such systems. Yep, Obama right. planned to put them there and then cancel these plans, mm -hmm. but when he came going to office, put, when he came he's going office. to put the same weapons o on ships. And, and again, Mark Rubio says, I will accept Cuba when uh, the Russians are out of Lourdes. Russians are out of Lourdes <laughs> since 2003. <laughs> and Vladimir Putin took them out of there. Well, but these people the simply only, don't The do good facts. thing is Marco Rubio is already out here. I want to talk mm -hmm. about the word um, uh, partition has come up again. And what I find when it comes to Syria, and what I find really, really astounding and, and, and outrageous is that a number of articles in Western media claim that Russia is on board for the partition of Syria, which is completely Never not been. true at Never all, been. Mark. Well, previously, they were actually blaming Russia for trying to partition Syria by saving the Syrian state, the entire coastline where 70% of the Syrian people live under the protection of the Syrian government, by not supporting uh, you know, the overthrow of the government by sectarian uh, Salafist forces. Um, but, um, you know, we're moving a little bit uh, further down the, the, the line with this talk of partition. Kerry discussed it uh, a couple weeks ago when he talked about a plan B. People, it's seriously... I never had a plan B. Ah, now had plan he B. walks it back, <laughs> right. flip-flops, and walks around the issue. So some people are talking about it, mm -hmm. uh, not mentioning that he was okay. the one talking so, about it. So he it. said something to the New York Times, the New York Times reporter, now he's reacting now to he's, it, right? Now he's walking back. But we have 
have uh, in the pages of foreign policy uh, a, a, a former U.S. admiral, former commander of, ah, uh, of yes. forces, NATO forces in Europe, Stavridis. Um, he officially puts forward the case for uh, the partition of Syria on sectarian ethnic lines, effectively calling for uh, Syria to go uh, ethnic cleansing, to move you, you one know, population you know what's really pathetic about, that, pathetic about that, Mark, if I go to yeah. Dima, is that Syria always prided itself on not being sectarian. That's one of its calling but, cards in the Middle but East. But let's look, you know, why did the United States and Britain and other colonial powers, why did they always prefer small states to big ones? Why did, why did they protest when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990? Not because they were such humanists, but if you extract oil, if you're an oil company and you extract oil in Bahrain, you share the profits with 500,000 or 300,000 Bahrainis. If you extract oil in Egypt, you share it with 85 million Egyptians. So that's why all of these Western powers and the Western oil companies, that's why they're interested in having oil in, in these small enclaves. De facto, Iraq has been partitioned. Yes. You know, the, the Kurd state well, in the and north. We, and you know, before we go to the break, you know, let's remember south. that Israel it has a very strong interest. If you look at the report that came out of the Brookings Institution uh, a few months ago, is that Israel would prefer to have these little statelets on its border where it can push, uh, it could uh, divide and conquer them. I mean, push the Sunnis against the Shia. I mean, again, it's the West that is pushing sectarianism. It doesn't come from the region. It's being pushed onto the region from the and outside. And the oil companies, I think, much more than Israel. I think Israel is Santa Claus compared to not just, oil not companies just the oil, the EU. But the gas as well. No, no, of course, one talk, the, no, no one the talks two about the competing gas, gas lines off the coast of, the, for, of Syria. Yeah. It's been discovered some years ago. It's supposed to be one of the biggest in the world. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on stories from the media. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing stories in the media. Okay, Mark, I want to stay with the, the Syrian partition issue because the, depending on who you want to, uh, who you ask, I mean, the, there are more groups that are agreeing to be part of some kind of process here. Um, but at the same time, we, as we said earlier, uh, Washington is backtracking, looking for other alternatives here. It's because of, again, Russian success in this, uh, this situation. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And when you point out uh, that uh, the, the United States has supported sectarianism uh, in this now drive for partition because their regime change attempts have failed. That's uh, extremely uh, important to note. I mean, the Syrian government, for all its warts and faults, is a multi-ethnic, yep. multi-confessional, secular republic in the Middle East. I mean, that's, we're not talking, uh, you know, Western Europe here. We're talking the Middle East and North Africa, where... Syrian democracy, however flawed it's been up to this point, makes Saudi Arabia and Qatar two of the driving forces who are supposedly fighting for and democracy and the growing authoritarianism of Turkey. They, they look like paragons of democracy compared, uh, you know, to Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, and th this push for sectarianism. We saw it first in Libya, uh, uh, more on, 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 on tribal lines. But we, we, we see it uh, again here, uh, and you're right, replicated over from Iraq. Uh, Russia is often accused in the Western press, very incorrectly using the term of hybrid warfare. This is the new <laughs> buzzword, right? It's all completely uh, uh, misused a standard military tactic as long as war has been with us. Uh, but what they're actually usually talking about is unconventional warfare. And I'm referring to the U.S. military doctrine out of the U.S. military handbook of the same name. You can find copies of it online. You can, you can Google it for yourself, unconventional warfare manual. And the stated purpose of this is to exploit existing ethnic, religious, economic, uh, sectarian well, divisions we, we saw and then we, use those 
as a weapon to but enact but U.S. foreign policy. We saw policy. it in Yugoslavia. That's from one of the yeah. first times they <coughs> use it and they repeated it ever since, Dima. Again, I think that the authors of these articles in the national interest and the Atlantic, they all have amnesia because when they write that uh, Iran and Russia intervened in Syria, <laughs> uh, I love this text in the moon of Alabama, you know, the only text in the American media where they said that, just remember it, it was actually Saudi Arabia and the West who intervened first, yeah. accusing Russia and Iran of intervening in Syria is like accusing France and Britain for supporting Poland in 1939 blaming, after it was invaded by Germany. And now blaming, blaming Russia for the migrant crisis in well, Europe, for goodness sake. Exactly. Because well, Putin is, is, when is weaponizing when the you, refugees, When you look right? at all yeah. these articles here, is just as Dima Bobbage pointed out, you know, when Russia and Iran intervened. Well, let's remember, let's remind our viewers, they were invited by the um, legitimate government in Damascus, represented in the United Nations and around the world. It is the sovereign right of that country to request assistance. Every time the Americans fly a sortie, the, Can the Canadians, if they still do it, the British, if they still do it, the French, they still is, uh, is violating the international law and violating the sovereignty of Syria. Western audiences are never told that. But Rory, mm -hmm. the weaponization of the truth, okay, um, that's what we're trying to do here. Is Russia, according to Ben Judah, uh, mm -hmm. Russia is trying to subvert um, the UK and subvert Anglo Merkel and Putin, subvert, you know, Putin wants a Brexit. the European Putin Union as we know. Destroying Europe by bringing in these migrants and these refugees. <laughs> I mean, look, why, why doesn't Brussels just give another four billion euros to Turkey? For goodness' sake, I suppose perhaps the Erdogan family is hurting a little bit after Russia bombed all of its ISIS oil convoys going across the border, upset that economic racket. So let's give Turkey a few more billion now. You're going to give us one refugee well, for one migrant. No one, no one in Western media called it as the way it is, but it was basically blackmail mm. and, and Brussels. Caved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. but it, according to the Western media, it's not Erdogan's fault, or it's, <laughs> it's not Europe and the West's fault for fueling a sectarian conflict. A five for year five conflict, years. okay. It's, it's Putin's, it's Russia's fault for going in. So, so blame Putin. And this, this piece in the Independent, uh, the, the UK as uh, newspaper by Ben Judah, who makes a, a career out of, of uh, Russia. He's a bashing. conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Okay. It is a conspiracy theorist and attempts to blame everything for the problems that Europe is having from uh, what is frankly a, an undemocratic uh, 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 migration policy uh, that is being pushed from Brussels onto uh, all the countries of Europe, many who don't want it, many in uh, some of the countries well, who are accepting even it. Even 81 percent of Germans, Germans polled yeah. are against Merkel's uh, uh, immigration migration policy. But, but, well, Russia doesn't have to do anything in this situation. Believe this article, that the, the, this is entirely Putin's fault. It, it, it blows the mind as if there were no uh, migrants uh, uh, entering Europe when half of them aren't even from when Syria until Russia intervened and, and, in the Syrian crisis. 21 weeks ago, ago. okay, here, not five years ago. Here's a fact. According to the UNHCR, from, uh, from, uh, since the start of, of the Russian intervention, the number of migrants entering Europe has actually gone down, down. every month except for October. Now, that, that may be during the winter, but it clearly shows that there isn't a mass flux of immigrants simply And there's no causality with Russia's but, policy. Go ahead. Uh, let me remind you of the headline of this article by Ben Jude in The Independent. Those who call for Brexit are handing European power to the Kremlin. And, <laughs> end of it. You know, it reminds me of the classics of propaganda. During the Second World War, the people who pushed for car sharing, they had this poster. If you drive alone, you drive with Hitler. This is classics of propaganda. You know, it's called a bandwagon. If you don't support a certain, usually false theory, then you are with our enemies. Mm. And, and, and the, the simple logic, you know, these people, uh, uh, the people who write these articles, they simply don't remember the, se the sequence of events. The war in Syria has been going on for three years before Russia moved its airplanes uh, to Syria. Uh, uh, the, the Maidan uh, uh, violent coup has been going on for four months before, before. Russia mm -hmm. moved to mm -hmm. Crimea. So basically, these people, they just use the fact that people have bad memory, that they don't you remember know, what followed what, also what is and it, they but it's very, it. But it's very convenient, Rory. It's all very convenient. I mean, you have this migration crisis. It's a crisis for, for some people, let's put it that way, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, Germany think, thinks it has a right to call the shots for the entire European Union. A, a lot of uh, other members are very much against that, particularly in the East here. But, you know, when there's a big problem, if it's in the UK or it's in, it's in Berlin, 
media likes to find one person, one country for all the ills it's, of the yeah, world. The, 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 the one size fits all. You know, well, the head well, of the NATO. Oh, NATO. Well, well, loves a whole no, but story, you would, but you would you expect know. that from the head of NATO because he needs an enemy to keep his job and to pad his and, budget. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. NATO must be yeah, he's, he's not an idiot, you know, but he's very greedy and he's disingenuous. Go ahead. Well, you know, I interviewed the deputy mayor of Calais the other day. You might, of course, you know the migrant camp, the jungle there on the border of northern France, and they're trying to get across the channel. And the deputy mayor said. Brussels has abandoned us. They are not helping us at all. I said, well, all those billions they, they gave to Turkey, perhaps they should have sent some of that money <laughs> to you and Calais. He said, we're getting no help anyway. And he said, there's no help coming from Paris either. And Rory, there's no guarantee that the Turks are going to do anything, mm. okay? Mm. They took the money, that's for sure, mm. okay? Yeah. Uh, they've been paid, but they, uh, have they been paid off? There's <laughs> a difference yeah, that's, between that's the two point, isn't it? Yeah. You know, in the 40s, the West was accused of appeasing Hitler appeasing the aggressor. Now they're just stuffing the aggressor with money. You know, mm -hmm. the more Mr. Erdogan misbehaves in Syria, the more money he gets from Europe. It? <laughs> Go ahead, well, it, it, it goes beyond, of course, the migrant crisis and this same article. Ben Judah also accused that anyone who votes for Brexit for the, uh, in the UK, anyone who votes for the UK leaving the EU in the upcoming promised referendum uh, is voting, uh, in effect, voting for Putin to for take Putin, over yes. the world. Do you think people uh, are buying that? Yeah, Do you actually think, think that when they read this, people are buying this? I, people I, I are going to vote for Putin in there. He's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's been so hey, that might be a really good no, outcome. No, no, Why not? No, 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 the really <laughs> interesting thing is that in the, the British media the Russians has, at least leaked the story in the past few days. It started in the Daily Mail, but the Guardian's now considering it as well, that the Queen of England actually backs Brexit. And it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. She's concerned about the sovereignty of the, the monarchy that she rules. But you know what that means, of course. She's backing Putin. The Queen of England is secretly a Putinist <laughs> Kremlin agent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to switch gears yeah. here because there's a really important story developing in the South China Sea. Mm. Now, and we see um, a, a greater American military presence. We've, you know, we've been looking at the, uh, the pivot to Asia, which it really is a code word uh, for the militarization of Southeast, uh, the South China Sea and to box China in. China is not going for it. So, no. Amer I'm sorry, America has okay. just sent, what, another five ships or, was it, or two task fleets? Two carrier them? forces. Now, look, the American 7th Naval, Naval Fleet has been out in that region for decades as it is. Typically, Stationed in Japan. Right. And a lot of their main ships actually sit above China's biggest natural gas field that's underneath the ocean there. I mean, talk about sitting on the economic jugular vein of what's going to be the world's biggest economy. Now, the Spratly Islands are very interesting. Why is America sending the ships there? Is it worth noting that in just a couple of weeks, in April, China is quietly test launching a golden yuan. Hmm. Is that related in any way, shape, or form? Now, just quickly, I just want to mention this as well. All right, uh, Breedlove, the NATO chap for Europe, he, he was uh, complaining recently in recent months about, about Putin and the S-300, this A-2 AED yeah, yeah, defense yeah. weapon system, right? Denial he, of, air, of access, denial that's of right. area. Yeah. That's right. And he was saying, you know, the Russians have created this, this 600 kilometer, this uh, diameter bubble, this defensive bubble in Kaliningrad. They did it in East Ukraine. Now they've done it in Syria. Well, guess what? Russia just sent some of this system to Armenia, an airfield in Armenia that happens to share a border with Turkey. India's got a big plan, a pallet, a big order for the S-300, S-400. China, have you seen it? The pictures? It looks like an S-300 to me in the Spratly Islands. <laughs> so the American warships are going over there. You've got the S-300 yeah, set up. You've got problem, bubbles popping up around the world. But the interesting thing is, Dima, this is mm -hmm. a provocation. This is to draw the Chinese out here. But one thing that I've always found very mysterious, I mean, the Americans claim that they're going to safeguard uh, a free passage uh, on the seas. Yes. But China, yeah, China but, has but, never but, threatened. And, and China has, number one, never threatened it. And you know what? It's kind of interesting because uh, being the being the factory of the world, that mm. they would want to make sure that they got their exports to their export markets. It's not and the American the resources exports. from the rest of the but, world mm. in to produce those products. But uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's interesting. It's not in the Russian media. It's in the American media, in this moon of Obama, that they call a spade a spade. They say that Obama is involved in a preemptive war against the peaceful rise of China. Mm. End of period. And mm. the result is that the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, mm. comes to Moscow, and they agree with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, 100 percent on North Korea, on the situation in Syria. This is not because Russia is so enraptured about China and China is so enraptured about Russia, but we are forced to be allies by the, the policies of the United States. Okay, the unintended consequences of foreign policy. Gentlemen, we've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here, RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.
We'll see. I'm seeing it. Signed. Right. Ah, ah. I love it. Okay. 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 Okay.